Empower Hour that Empower Our Future is putting on tonight. We do have two more programs coming up in 2022. We are very delighted that in November on the 15th at 6 p.m., Leslie Glestrom will be leading a CCE 101 presentation. So we will learn about the legislation that has been studied this year in Colorado and um, its prospects for hopefully becoming a reality in Colorado. And then in December on the 6th, we'll have Ken Ruggleson. Ken manages to make even the most complicated topics clear to uh, just average bears, and he will be demystifying heat pumps. <laughs> in December, uh, and talking about air source versus ground source heat pumps. So uh, mark your calendars. A little housekeeping. I do want to be sure to thank right away our Empower Our Future team uh, of communication folks who work on, on these events. Uh, Chris Hoffman, Steve Whitaker, and Paul Cullen are terrifically involved and helpful in making these events happen. Um, so thank you all so much. Let me go ahead and do the land acknowledgement. And um, obviously, especially uh, important given yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day. We acknowledge and respect as non-Native people that the land on which we stand, live and learn is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Uh, we also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that our government, academic, and cultural institutions, and our nation itself, were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of Indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, oppression, and inequities, and to recognize the hundreds of Indigenous nations who continue to resist live, create, and uphold their sacred relations across the lands. Let us seek to understand what it means to be in right relationship today with the traditional stewards of this land and with this land itself and with all creatures that inhabit it. So finally, I want to get to the reason we're all here, which is to welcome Mayor Aaron Brockett. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate your being here. Um, a uh, software developer, uh, Aaron, first moved to Boulder's Holiday Neighborhood in 2003, and he helped build a community <coughs> and led group meetings as a member of the Wild Sage co-housing community. Uh, in 2011, he joined the planning board, where he served until 2015, and that year he was elected to city council. And uh, I believe it was uh, just last year that he was elected uh, to be our current mayor. Um, a fun and little known fact about Aaron is that he graduated with a music degree from Swarthmore College, uh, which I think is really neat. Um, he also was able to actually make a living as a professional musician uh, for several years. Again, pretty pretty nifty fact, uh, and uh, was uh, obviously a fine enough singer that he was a part of Arsenova uh, Boulder's premier choral group. Um, so again, thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Really appreciate that that lovely introduction, and uh, it was fun. Uh, actually went and visited with uh, Mary's daughter's uh, softball team not long ago. There was a home run derby competition that uh, a team of us from the city participated in. And while our home run total was zero, so we came in a uh, big tie for last, uh, we did have a really great time. It was wonderful to see Mary out there. Um, and uh, just to uh, fact check one thing, I was, uh, I think, a pretty good choral singer, but never earned a dime from it. So uh, the, the software was more the uh, money-making activity on my side. 
Um, and then just one other thing, I really appreciated that land acknowledgement, that very the, you know, thorough and appropriate land acknowledgement. And I'll just mention, following up from that, of course, Indigenous Peoples Day was yesterday. There have been a variety of events in the last few days, and there are another few going on this week. So if you go to the Peoples in uh, the Indigenous Peoples Day uh, page on the city's website, you can see there's still a couple more. But I'll just highlight one on Sunday. We had an incredibly powerful event. There was a remembrance of the Sand Creek Massacre. And there was a group of, of people, there were a group of us uh, who were community members, sort of read some of the narratives of the history. And then we had um, current members of the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes present as well, singing songs and telling uh, the stories of their ancestors. All of them were actually our descendants and survivors of, of that horrendous massacre. It was just incredibly powerful. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the work that the city is trying to do with our annual um, the work that we are doing um, with our annual consultations with the tribes that have uh, ties to this area to try to mend um, those relationships and make up just a little bit for all the terrible injustices that were done to the indigenous peoples over the years. And so I, I won't say much more before we get into the questions. Uh, Mary gave a good little overview of my life here. I will say that uh, fighting climate change is one of my absolute top priorities uh, as, a, as a community member and as an elected official. As we all know, it's the existential climate uh, crisis of our time that, 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 that threatens us all with uh, extinction. And you know, events like the, the Marshall Fire and the NCAR Fire and um, the floods, the droughts, they, they show us every day about the threats that we're facing and the ecosystem changes and loss. And so it's incredibly important work that we're doing uh, at the city of Boulder. We do everything that we can to reduce emissions um, within our city, but also recognize that you can't solve these issues win one 100,000 person city, right? So we, we work towards system change, both within the city and also how we can work with other cities, other municipalities, um, counties, et cetera, across the country and across the world to come up with shared solutions that when they're implemented across a, a larger area can make a real dent in the, in the total emissions of, of the world. And so one example of that, uh, the City was a co-founder of the Colorado Communities for Climate Action uh, some, I forget how many, seven, eight years ago now, um, along with Boulder County and I believe San Miguel County was the other one. Uh, and so that, that has grown from three entities back then to now more than 50 uh, uh, different cities and counties across Colorado. And so we work together. So a lot of our lobbying efforts um, are concentrated with that group. We, we work on a united front. And while I think mean, Boulder's voice is always respected and uh, listened to carefully in places like the state legislature and the governor, when we have so many different progressive communities working together, we find our voices are really amplified and we're able to accomplish larger changes than we would just on our own. And so we've seen some real successes at the legislature in the last few years. And uh, I think that uh, affiliation, that group and the city of Boulder itself can take a lot of credit for or how far some of that legislation was pushed. So with that, I'll um, I'll just say one last thing before I turn to, to Chris and, and the questions, uh, which is a quick joke, which is, uh, what is a wind turbine's favorite color? Blue. So with that, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. And we wanna thank you again. We wanna thank you for devoting so much of your time and energy to serve on city council and to serve as mayor for the benefit of the citizens of Boulder. And thank you for your dedication to climate issues. And also thank you very much for being available to the community for this session tonight. As you know, Empower Our Future has solicited questions from the community for this evening on our topics of climate and energy. We have received many questions and we want to let viewers know that in the interest of a well-informed discussion, we have given Mayor Brockett the questions in advance. So let's start with an easy one. I'd like to talk about the city scheduling the phase out of two stroke internal combustion engines like leaf blowers and lawnmowers. It's a climate health and social justice issue. For climate and health, according to the California Air Resources Board, operating a commercial leaf blower for just one hour emits smog forming pollution comparable to driving a new passenger car for about 1100 miles. And this social justice issue because 
the primitive two-stroke engines emit dangerous pollutants, and the noise often causes substantial and irreversible hearing loss to those who operate them. The victims are the low-wage workers, often immigrants, who are being deafened and poisoned by them. Cleaner and lower, lower maintenance electric versions of leaf blowers and lawnmowers are already available. And more than 100 US cities and towns have banned or restricted leaf blowers. California will halt the sale of most gas powered leaf blowers, lawnmowers, and other small off road engines in 2024. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, what would be the process for phasing out two stroke internal combustion engines in Boulder? Do you initiate it? How long would it take? Let us know what the process is. Uh, thanks for that question, Chris. And uh, I do have a, a barky dog in the house, so apologies uh, for a little bit of background noise. Um, and uh, also, I'm uh, excited about these questions. I know this is an incredibly knowledgeable uh, group, so um, I, hopefully I get all my facts right. I, I'm going to try my best, but I, I know you'll, you'll point something out in the chat if I, if I miss something. Well, so this is such a great question. I will say on a personal note, I, I loathe these things. Uh, my uh, Where I live is a little HOA 34 units and we use um, an electric lawnmower and no leaf blowers and uh, you know we just let the leaves build up and provide mulch with the soil it's, which is a great you know, circular way of approaching it but the, the HOA just across the street from us they have these they have people out there pursuing every last little leaf with a leaf blower for hours um, and uh, it's personally unpleasant and it's just so incredibly wasteful um, of the gasoline and, the, and high emissions and terrible and the poor workers out there doing it for, for hours and hours and hours. So um, I am happy to say that this is a work plan item that is al already underway at the city. So um, you know, council has expressed you know, this desire to staff over at least the last couple of years. So um, they are working on it right now. Um, we have hired an expert consultant, uh, the American Green Zone Alliance, who have worked with um, some of the California communities that have taken steps already um, in this area. And uh, we're also doing outreach to uh, regional partners to other cities around the region to talk about maybe some shared approaches um, that in ways maybe that we could um, work together, uh, both have consistent rules, but also if, for example, if you had buyback programs or incentive programs for the purchase of new equipment, if that's on a larger scale, you're going to get better deals um, on that, um, for example. So uh, this is, like I said, it's an active work. Staff is going to come to council. I believe it's going to be in the probably second quarter of 2023, and to come and check in with us about the next steps to take, and then from that guidance, they would then work on developing uh, an ordinance, uh, well, public uh, input and 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 an ordinance uh, on that. Um, I'll send. Hopefully, you all can send out some stuff. I'll pass along a. Um, couple of URLs because they did give us um, an information item about this just uh, two or three weeks ago that I can share with folks and also pass on the web page uh, at the city that talks about the work that we're doing here. That would be very helpful, Aaron. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder to our viewers that we will post the recording of this session. And when we post it, Aaron, anything you want to put as a URL, as a link, we will be happy to post on our website as well. Great. And I have a little bit more, if I may. So, yes, um, so that's good to be able to get that out. Anyway, so we this, this is an area that, that we need to uh, be considered, considered of equity issues on a broad scale. I think the question made the fantastic point that the impacts of operating these uh, equipment often falls on low wage, often immigrant workers. Um, but a lot of the users of the equipment are small businesses, often immigrant owned, who don't have a lot of capital, right? So that, that if you if you told a four person landscaping company they had to replace all their equipment in a month, they might well not have the capital to do that, right? So so we have to be really careful with the equity impacts kind of in, in that area as well. So um, we're, we're doing some outreach that this to the community, to, to business owners and to residents, you know, and also another uh, group, say, a lower income homeowner or renter uh, might be challenged to purchase new equipment on, on a, a low budget uh, as well, or people on fixed incomes, and et cetera. So, so we got to take all that into account. This is definitely something that we're going to be running through our racial equity tool to make sure that we don't disproportionately Im impact negatively you know, one um, uh, minority group or um, disadvantaged group. So we're going to be taking all that into account. And then when we look at that study session, we're going to consider options uh, you know, one would be a ban on sale. I don't know that matters a little less as a city than it does as a state, like in California. 
Um, I'm hoping to see personally um, a phased out uh, use, phasing out the use of gasoline powered lawn equipment. So that that's my goal and my hope. Uh, but I think we will have to look at a phasing. We're going to have to look at some incentives. We're going to have to look at financial support probably um, for, for lower income folks. So we'll be talking through all the options uh, early part of next year, but I'm, I will definitely be working towards a future of our city that does not include gasoline powered lawn equipment. That's great. Thank you. And, and just out of curiosity, on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being low and 10 being high, what is the likelihood of city council doing something like this? Oh, that's a great question. I'm not a betting man, Chris. I, I don't know. I, it's, uh, I haven't um, Since if, you're if I had told all my, all my colleagues it would be illegal. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I will say that I think you know, this, is, this is a climate and an equity focused council. And so um, I, I imagine there's going to be great interest in this topic. Okay. I know there will be. Good. And, and good. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to the next question is about the city banning methane or what the industry likes to call natural gas and all new construction as has been done by Crested Butte to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In 2019, the city council of Berkeley, California banned natural gas hookups in all new building construction. San Francisco and New York City have passed bans and the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, has vowed to pass a statewide law that would ban natural gas by 2027. Banning natural gas or methane in new construction comports with what the International Energy Agency said a year ago, which was, quote, if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, gas, and coal from now, from this year. And that was last year. So what would be the process for banning methane or natural gas in new construction in Boulder? How does it get initiated? How long would it take? Educate us about that process. Yeah, it's another excellent question. This, this is the future that we need to be moving towards, right? Is zero fossil fuel use in our buildings, right? That there was that kind of fallacy of natural gas as a rich fuel that people talked about a few years ago. And, and we need to leave that behind and move to a zero fossil fuel future for, for um, buildings. So um, this is also something that we're working on currently. Um, this is coming in as part of our energy code update that's going to be completed in 2023. I'll probably talk about that two or three times tonight because this is a big deal. We are on a regular cadence of updating our energy codes and our building codes every three years. And uh, you know, each time, you know, of course, the is, you know the their uh, um, IECC uh, has, releases a new code periodically. And so our, our goal is always to catch up with that, but then overtake it, right? We, so we always add our own additions that make our energy codes um, more stringent. And so generally when we, like in the past, when we, just after we passed our codes, we'll be in the you know top one or two or three of the most stringent in the country. And then other folks will kind of catch up to us. And then we get to our next update and we you know, leapfrog again. So uh, I'm really excited about this. In, it, for the 2023 update, I, I must confess, I geek out on this stuff. Uh, so, you know, I remember I, I've been working on these since my time on planning boards. So this has been 11 years or something that, that we've been reviewing the building codes uh, that I've been on these boards and councils. And I think this is this time around is a time to make a really big jump. Um, I think, you know, the climate crisis, we all have known how bad it is for a long time, but you know, I think the evidence is, is getting greater with every passing month. Um, you know, just, just look at the Hurricane Ian is another recent incredibly horrible example, and they're just going to keep coming. So I, I think we have to really push this one uh, pretty hard. And so I, I'm confident that we're going to be making some really good steps in general here. Um, we are working on staffing up a little bit. We, we need to restaff our chief building official and our energy code coordinator. So we, we're going to need a little bit of help on this. But our, our staff has already done a lot of the groundwork um, for this update. So it's come along really well. So, um, you know, we'll definitely be looking, I, I think, looking very seriously at a you know, no natural gas requirement for, for future constructions. So that is absolutely on the table. Um, you know, I'm very interested in, in implementing that. Um, I think in, you, know, you do have to take care, you know, evaluate you know, the current state of, kind of construction technology. So, like, you have to make sure that, you know, legally, you have to make sure that your building codes are actually uh, in, uh, that you can en enable, that you can actually build those codes. It's feasible to build those codes. 
right? And so, and I think as as this group knows, y'all are super knowledgeable about this stuff. That uh, you know, for for a residence, um, for a typical office building, like all electric construction is incredibly doable right now. We've seen recent examples of like the Boulder Commons or Thirty Pearl and Boulder Junction recently that are all electric construction. You know, they're 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 doing great. Um, so that's. Those are all very doable. Uh, where a couple of like Berkeley is is in the process of a lawsuit where uh, like their uh, commercial uh, restaurant op operator has challenged that hey I actually can't uh, create a commercial kitchen without at least a little bit of natural gas. So they're being sued about that right now. Mm -hmm. So we have to be be careful a little bit than that, or there or think about maybe some industrial processes. There there may conceivably be some high end industrial processes that that might not be electric ready at this point. So. So maybe we don't need that industry in town. I'm not sure, but these are some of the you know we, there are some of these kind of subtle issues that you have to look at um, because particularly if there have been precedents set, like if Berkeley loses that lawsuit, you know we're gonna have to look carefully exactly how that came out. So, um, but I think um, I think we're gonna get there uh, at least some version of it in, in this energy code. And I know like in my own personal like my uh, my townhouse does, is all electric. Which, which I love, and we have induction cooking. I, I don't know if you all have induction. It's phenomenal. It's like better than gas. It's it's amazing. Currently, our our hot water comes from a central boiler that's natural gas fired. But uh, our HOA is looking like, okay, heat pumps have, have have come the distance, right? They're ready. They are ready for prime time. They're here. So uh, one of these days, uh, hopefully not too long from now, we're going to replace this with uh, with heat pumps so that our personal Great. life will be all electric as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, and now related to this, we've received a lot of questions related to Boulder's building stock. And we've summarized the questions in two parts. And uh, the first is three uh, shorter questions. And I'll read the three questions and then I'll read them again so you could just tackle them one at a time. The first one is most of the new buildings, commercial, multifamily, and single family teardown rebuilds are being built without rooftop solar panels or other renewables. So the question is, how can the city leverage more renewables on these projects? I'll read that one again. Uh, the second is many condo complexes are 40 plus years old and have had no upgrades, while property management fees prevent HOAs from creating reserves. Can you talk about ways to encourage, incentivize, or force HOAs to invest in climate upgrades such as EV charging, mini splits, insulation, and high performance windows? And the third one is, does the city have plans for offering community solar so that apartment dwellers can get access to clean power? So those are the three, and I'll just start with the first one again. Most of the new buildings, commercial, multifamily, and single family teardown rebuilds are being built without rooftop solar panels or other renewables. How can the city leverage more renewables on these projects? Okay, uh, this is really good. Um, well, so while you may be seeing buildings that are getting finished right now that don't have solar panels, actually our current codes do require solar on new construction. So, you know, the, it, those it can take many years between the approval of a project and the construction of a project and, and they're subject to the codes uh, that we had at the time that they're approved. So uh, if you've seen a recent building get built without solar, um, it's because it's, it's been in the pipeline for a while. But I am, I'm happy to say that we do have updated requirements So in this area. So for example, uh, commercial construction has to meet at least 5% of their energy use with on-site solar. And most, uh, and then the way our buildings code work, building codes work is that most installations uh, require a lot, a much higher percentage th than that in order to meet the, the building code requirements. And uh, residential projects of greater than 3,000 square feet, like the teardown placements that we were talking about, actually have to meet 100% of their energy use with solar. And that includes uh, if they have any pools or something like that that uses extra energy. So, um, so they have to meet 100% of their needs and they're required to meet those on site to the degree feasible. You know, if they're on a, a lot with you know all 60 foot tall trees, they might not be able to do all of it on site, but uh, we require on site to the extent possible and then off site um, to meet any of the, the rest of it. Um, and then it's been some years as well that we have required buildings to be solar ready. So before we required on site solar, we did require solar ready buildings. This is going back many years. Um, my memory is not uh, astute enough to tell you which building code update we did that in, but I remember passing it on planning board um, many years ago. 
and then I'll also note this isn't solar precisely, but uh, but we do have uh, electric vehicle charging requirements now. Um, so uh, like a single family home would require a dedicated circuit to charge an EV. Uh, commercial projects uh, require um, uh, a certain number of chargers per uh, spaces that they have. I can't give you exact numbers off the top of my head, um, but um, and multifamily uh, residential also requires a certain number of chargers. And then we require a certain number of active chargers, and then we require a certain number of other spots to be um, EV charging ready. So they have to be pre-wired so that they can be implemented uh, pretty quickly. And my, uh, I have a 13-year-old uh, senior pup, and he needs help to, to get up sometimes. So okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, just the last bit on the, the uh, solar, um, just to mention that, that we're, we're pushing, the state is pushing the envelope on, on building codes as well in the solar area and in others. So we have now minimum building code standards for, for the entire state. And uh, my colleague, uh, Lauren Fulkertz, uh, testified on behalf of that bill. It was, it was uh, 22-13-62. So uh, when we talk about the systems change, the broader change that we need on a larger level, uh, we were all really excited to see uh, state level building code minimums get passed. Um, so everybody will be coming up to a certain standard. Okay, thank you. In, in the next, um, we've got two more and maybe a couple uh, in about a minute apiece, maybe you could address these. Uh, the next one is the one about condo complexes that are over 40 plus years old and have had no upgrades while property management fees prevent HOAs from creating reserves. Can you talk about ways to encourage, incentivize, or force HOAs to invest in climate upgrades such as EV charging, et cetera? <laughs> Yeah, and I, sorry, I'm talking a little bit long. I'm getting excited about this stuff, and uh, there goes the dog. But um, so this is a tough one because it's hard to force anybody to do a, a retrofit. Um, and yeah, kind there of. are limited options to to force property owners to make changes to existing buildings. We have done this through the Smart Rex program for people with rental licenses. So we have minimum energy code requirements for rental properties. Um, and there are some um, new state performance requirements that are that are phasing in uh, over the next few years that, that I think will produce some changes. Um, but actually, we're, there's a later question, I think, that gets into the, this idea of um, broader funding for retrofits. And so I'll, I'll wait to talk about that there. OK. And then the, the last one in this first set is, does the city have plans for offering community solar so that apartment dwellers can get access to clean power? Yeah, so the primary avenue for this is through the uh, Solar Garden Program, which is a state level program. Uh, the City of Boulder was a big supporter of it when it was first passed in 2010. So you can, there are a variety of private solar gardens that are out there taking applications right now. So your best bet right now would be to do, um, you know, through that, through a new solar garden process. But we are um, doing some for, for some uh, specialized community. For example, we have one city uh, solar garden. It's small, it's just 100 kilowatts, but it's dedicated to the energy usage for uh, the residents of Ponderosa Mobile Home Park, which is in North Boulder and was annexed a couple of years ago. And so that's an almost all lower income community. And so we're, we're giving all of them free renewable electricity you know, from that solar garden. So we're looking at potentials to do other things like that, that that might be able to offer for some specialized populations where we offer some city owned options. Great, thank you. And the second part of this uh, building stock question is uh, essentially a bigger bite at the problem. Uh, this past July, the city of Ithaca, New York signed a contract with Block Power to manage a first of its kind electrification effort to decarbonize the entire building stock of the city. The contract represents the first large-scale citywide building electrification initiative in the U.S. and a major step forward in Ithaca's plans to, to become carbon neutral by 2030. And if viewers are interested, they can find a link to the NPR story and other information about this on the EOF website. Block Power's proposal estimates that the project will cut Ithaca's 40, 400,000 tons of CO2 by 40% and create 400 new green economy construction technology and management jobs. And at the same time, it will make financing green energy upgrades affordable by providing low cost loans to building owners, which they will then pay back through the significant energy cost savings received. So the question is, what would it take to do something similar to in Boulder? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a really exciting initiative. I've been reading about that for a while. And I think what, what they've been able to do there in Ithaca with block power is to leverage private investment uh, to uh, green up their building stock. And so, was, of course, public funds are limited. So uh, getting that, leveraging that private funding is, is a key piece of making it happen on a broad scale. So we're definitely looking at this model. This is on our radar. Um, so I'll put in a plug for the 6A climate tax here. I'm, uh, hopefully this group is, is very supportive, but you know, that's on the ballot here in November. And if it's passed, it's gonna significantly increase the funds that we have available for investment in, in clean technology and climate change fighting solutions. So that could provide us with the, the matching funds to bring in some private partners because you have to have some skin in the name. You have to have a significant amount of uh, public money on the table as well. So this is definitely one of the steps that we're looking to take if the climate tax passes is to reach out to maybe it's block power, maybe a, a different private company to see if we could work together to produce um, an impressive initiative like it that's been able to do. Great. And your answer to this next one is probably going to be the same as the earlier one, but I'll just ask on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being low and 10 being high, what is the likelihood of the city council doing something like this? Well, I'll say this is probably not as much in the city council's bailiwick because it is staff implementing you know, programs through the climate action plan tax. So, uh -huh, I see. Uh, so I think it's sort of more of a practical question uh, rather than a, a council policy question. But I, I'm guessing that council would be very supportive of something like this. Great. Thank you. So next question, empower our viewers learned about some of the benefits of community choice energy in the July 21st Empower Hour with Jeff Seifer as the CEO of Sonoma Clean Power. And again, the recording is viewable at the empowerourfuture.org slash events. So while Excel is making progress, they are doing so slowly and at monopoly prices. Do you see any reason why the City Council of Boulder would not support providing a community choice energy or CCE option to all Colorado communities that want to see if they can obtain a better deal for their electricity. Yes, and we've already taken a position of support on this in the past. Mm -hmm. you know, when when uh, Representative E. Hooten brought this forward in, in 2020, the, the bill that created the study process for CCE, uh, we were on support of that. So we passed a resolution in support of that. And we have uh, lobbied for it down at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may know that this is not uh, Excel Energy's favorite idea, uh, but mm -hmm. we have. They've occasionally tried to uh, force us to say we would not support this. Or we have resisted those attempts. So we continue to be supportive of it as a city and as a, as a council. Um, so yeah, I, I, it would be a phenomenal way for, for us to, to be able to get to um, bridge our renewable energy gap. And it's been very successful in, in a state like in California where it's been implemented. So I would love to see it happen. And you mentioned that the city has already been lobbying in favor of this. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, and, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, and I'll and I'll just mention. So you know, I think that just a little bit more on that. That the the study is being completed. I think in a couple months. Mm -hmm. It was created by by Representative Putin's bill. So we're really looking forward to seeing what it has to say, and we'll we'll stay actively engaged. Um, as as y'all probably know, Representative Putin is uh, not running again for the legislature, um, but uh, you know her. Uh, Almost certain replacement, uh, Jimmy, my current colleague, Jimmy Joseph, um, is also a supporter of this idea as well. So um, we're looking forward to seeing maybe what Jimmy and, and other folks in the legislature, how they can move forward in the next session. Great, thank you. And, and just a reminder to our viewers that the uh, next month's Empower Hour will be Community Choice Energy CCE 101. Uh, so if you're interested and want to learn more about this topic, tune in next month. So next question, Power Hour viewers learned about some of the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act at the September 20th in Power Hour with Katie Keenbaum of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And again, the recording is viewable at the empowerourfuture.org slash events website. So this question is, what steps are being taken by the city to take advantage of funds from the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, in Fossil free fuel, fossil free buses, fleet vehicles, microgridding, securing water storage and energy storage, conditioning homes and businesses for climate driven fires and floods, heat pumps, solar, solar and storage, securing open space, EVs, charging, storage, things like that. 
Yes, well, we are following this extremely closely. Uh, so the, the amount of funding that's available from the federal government in the last two years and going forward is unprecedented, at least in our, in our generation, let's say. There's a once in a lifetime opportunity to get federal funds to, to realize transformations, certainly in fighting climate change. Uh, and then there've been other areas as well that have gotten significant funding. So uh, so we're, we're tracking all the opportunities very closely. It does take a while for these funds to start flowing. So it's probably not gonna be sometime until mid, late 2023 that, that uh, the programs will be created that you can then apply for. So the federal agencies are gonna develop program rules and then the most of the funds will flow through state offices. Um, so so it's, we got a little while um, before we're gonna be able to actually apply for the grants, but, but we're keeping a very close eye on it. You know, one thing that, that's exciting about the, the IRA, um, maybe you heard about this already, is that, you know, in the past, uh, renewable energy installations have been eligible for uh, tax credits. But if you are a municipal government or another tax exempt entity, you've been unable to realize any uh, financial benefit directly from renewable installations. And so then you end up doing third party things where you, a, third, a private entity installs the solar and then you lease it back from them. And we've done that successfully in a few places like over by the water treatment plant up on 63rd Street. Um, but now you'll be able to realize the financial benefits directly. And that's going to unlock some new opportunities for us because essentially without, since, since you can eliminate the middleman, you'll be able to get a higher return on the investment with the investment tax credits coming to the, the city directly. So uh, this, we're excited to look for more opportunities to do solar on city facilities and more solar gardens around town. Um, so those are some opportunities. And I will just mention that all these grants that are becoming available, we're actually, um, we are funding, I mean, the final approval of the budget isn't for a couple of weeks, but it's almost certain to get approved, uh, funding an additional grant position, because we always have folks in different departments applying for grants all the time, but we're going to have a new additional full-time person at the city who all they do is look out for their appropriate grants and then work with the city departments to apply for those. So we're on this for sure. We're excited about the opportunities. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. In the more than 600 days of the partnership with Excel Energy, the city has received no greenhouse gas reductions beyond what any other Excel customer has received. The discussions at the advisory panel meetings seem to be dragging on without result. So we'd like to know more. Uh, essentially three questions. What projects can you point to that are attributable solely to the partnership agreement with Excel? What role do you think Excel Boulder Partnership Agreement will play in achieving the city's goal of 100% renewable electricity by 2030? And what would you want Excel to deliver to Boulder in order for you not to vote to withdraw from the franchise? So I'll go through those again. Uh, what projects can you point to that are attributable solely to the partnership agreement with Excel? Yeah, well, I'm going to combine this with the other one because I'm I'm afraid in terms of things that are completed on the ground, the answer to this is none, <laughs> um, because the it has been moving slowly. There's no question, and that's that's been frustrating for all of us. Uh, you know, it took a long time for the settlement to get approved by the PUC, and then it's taken a long time for the discussions on the programs to to get negotiated, and and then I think some of you are, are on the the advisory panel. There's some great folks doing work out there. Um, but it's taking time to kind of move forward, pick projects and, and get those implemented. So it, it is moving, you know, so far it's moved more slowly than, than any of us would like, but I think the momentum is gathering and we're gonna see some more concrete um, steps coming out of it before too long. So I'll just mention a couple of early things that are in the pipeline. Well, and I'll just step back for a minute because you know, reducing emissions is of course a, a key goal of this partnership, but we also have to turn it, uh, more and more to climate, climate resiliency because we know the scale of the impacts that the, the climate change is going to have and so we have to be working on resiliency as well. So one of our first projects is um, an undergrounding of the, the of, above ground power lines in the Chautauqua neighborhood. Um, so that's that's an area that is at very high risk of fires um, either that start outside or, or if, the, if the power line were to go down. So uh, and then, of course, that's a beautiful historic area that matters a great deal to us. So that's a climate resiliency project that we're going to be working on together, tapping some private funding, some public funding, and working with Excel to, to get that done. Um, another one that, that's coming up is, uh, you know, currently we have a 
vehicle to grid pilot at the North Boulder Rec Center. I will talk about it in more detail, but I know we don't have that much time, but it's it's a promising beginning of a of a where the, the the car can charge the rec center and the rec center can charge the car. And if there's a huge disaster, the car or actually we could bring in one of the electric hot buses, plug it in and power the rec center and give people a safe place to, to stay, but it also reduces energy use as well. So we're looking at moving that to or adding a, an additional site to, to that pilot and potentially others before too long as both a resiliency and an emissions reduction move. And it saves a little bit of money too. And another thing that's it's taken, it's going to take a little while here as well, but we're working on setting up an energy district at the Alpine Balsam redevelopment site where the old hospital used to be. So we're working on a, a partnership with the Excel there on a microgrid that where the whole, all the, you know, it's probably however many dozens, hundreds of units get built there uh, will be on a microgrid grid that, that's, that has resiliency and can, can also you know, channel renewables on site um, into an energy district there. Um, but uh, we know we, we got a lot more um, that we want to be doing uh, uh, with this partnership. So related to that, what would you want Excel to deliver to Boulder in order for you not to vote to withdraw from the franchise? Yeah, well, so I will say that Excel has not uh, been holding this up in any way. It's sort of been taking a long time now because people are working in bad faith, but just you know, approvals and and such. So we, we want to see them continue to work with us in good faith and moving uh, these proposals forward and the partnership forward. We want to see them working with us hand in hand um, at the PUC and at the legislature. So if to the extent that we need enabling legislation um, or to the extent that we need PUC approvals, which we probably will for some of the partnership activities, we want to see that happen together. I'll just mention you, we did do that part of the settlement agreements that we would go hand in hand to the legislature to change the um, maximum solar that was allowed on a residential unit. And we were successful in getting that legislation passed and Excel and the city did uh, uh, lobby on that together. So we ex expect them to continue delivering on the partnership commitments. We expect them to continue, that they have to make sure that they're giving us reliable e electricity and they need to hit their goals as well um, in, in terms of the uh, um, electric goals, um, the renewable electricity goals. And I mean, Hopefully they'll go well past them if they're super, super close, but they're trying, they're, they've got a roadmap for getting there. We'll have to look at it carefully, um, but we need to make sure that they continue on that roadmap that they've promised us for uh, renewable energy milestones going on into the future. Thank you. And about the proposed climate tax ballot measure, if it passes, the city of Boulder staff and council will need to make many decisions on how that money will be spent and how to choose among many competing projects. What procedures do you think the city staff and council should use to engage the Boulder community and to make decisions about where and how to spend those climate action funds? And how will the city quantify and report the greenhouse gas reductions per dollar spent? And a related question, what do you see as the most cost-effective way to reduce greenhouse gases produced in Boulder? So I'll go over those again. The first is, what procedures do you think city staff and council should use to engage the Boulder community and to, to, and to make decisions about where and how to spend these climate action funds? Yeah, so I mean, I think public input will be critically important. This is gonna be a significant additional amount of money for climate action. And so we want to engage with the community in that. So public outreach is gonna be an important part. So I'll let the communication department design exactly what that should look like, but it should be robust because we want to make sure that experts, community experts like yourselves have a, a major voice in determining exactly what projects are tackling. And then how will the city quantify and report the greenhouse gas reductions per dollar spent? So I'm not sure exactly, but I think uh, report on progress will be extremely important. So we want to put out the measures of what the successes are of the program, what dollars were spent, what benefits were realized. Exactly how that gets reported out, I'm not sure, but it'll be an important part of the process. And and what do you see as the most cost-effective way to reduce greenhouse gases produced in Boulder? Well, I mean that's a whole huge topic in and of itself. Yeah. I you know we could go on about that for a long time, but yeah, I mean oftentimes efficiency is the, the the most efficient place to put your dollars at first, right? Like the the kilowatt hour you never use is often the the, the cheapest emissions. Mm, 
So empower our viewers, next question, empower our viewers learn about the problems with the proposed annexation of CU South in the August 16th Empower Hour. And again, the recording is available at empowerourfuture.org slash events. So setting aside the other negative impacts of CU South on traffic, housing, endangered species, open space, utility rates, quality of life, and adequate flood protection, there seems to be a basic conflict between the proposed annexation and the proposed climate tax. The climate tax is supposed to reduce greenhouse gas production, while annexation is certain to increase greenhouse gas production by, among other things, adding car trips, non-net zero buildings, and by degrading a wetland. For example, a study by the Conservation Fund found that wetlands store 81 to 216 me metric tons of carbon per acre. This suggests that the CU South property stores at least 10,000 metric tons of carbon, and we have seen no ideas about the, how the city or CU plans to make up the difference. So all of this together seems like stepping on the gas and the brake at the same time. Your comments. No, I really appreciate the question. I'm, I'm gonna challenge the underlying assumption though in the, in the question here, because I, I don't in fact think that this is, is a negative from a climate change perspective, right? So, I mean, there's no question that when you build buildings, you have then emissions that are generated from that location that didn't exist before. Now, if you're building super high efficiency buildings that, that hopefully is minimal, you know, all electric, um, uh, very well insulated, et cetera, et cetera. And the state, um, CU is bound by the state's building code, which um, is quite stringent and is getting better on a rapidly accelerating pace. So there's no question that when you build a building where there wasn't there before, that site now has higher emissions. But of course, climate change is a global phenomenon. So if let's say you build uh, 100 units of housing at CU South, and it's faculty staff um, housing, uh, it's faculty staff student housing. So most, almost all of faculty and staff who um, start working at City of Boulder cannot afford to live in the city of Boulder. So they're coming in from often far flung places. You know, if we're lucky it's, it's Louisville or Broomfield, but it's often Firestone or Dakota or something like that. So if those 100 folks are, are moving into newly built uh, energy efficient housing from far flung places, where they had to have long commutes that are burning fossil fuels or in a minimum using a lot of energy, um, you actually have not made emissions uh, larger on, a, on the whole scheme of things, right? You've actually reduced emissions in our society as a whole. So I think by, by building the housing on a close in, on a place with really good transit access, really good bikeability to see you, um, I think you can make a huge difference in transportation emissions with a project like that. And also on the wetland side, I was not at the August 16th uh, meeting, but well, there are a few acres of wetland that would be degraded by the construction of the flood mitigation project, the, the, uh, the proposal also includes the restoration of uh, many more acres than will be degraded. So it actually will have a good net positive effect on the wetlands in the area by the time the whole project gets done in you know, 10 or 15 years or something like that. So I really don't think that, that CU South is a, a negative for the climate overall. Mm. Okay. And again, I'd remind you interested viewers could check out the recording of the full program on this uh, on the August 16th Empower Hour about the annexation of CU South. Uh, next question. Uh, currently, City of Boulder staff appear to be making decisions about when and how to engage with the Colorado Public Utilities Commission or PUC without broad two-way community engagement, or even to the best of our knowledge uh, from the questioner, uh, consulting with city council. So what changes would you suggest to ensure that the city staff engage in thoughtful two-way discussions with the community and the city council concerning PUC actions? Yeah, and I know there have been some frustrations in this area, and they're, they're understandable because the, the amount of outreach during the ERP settlement process you know, at the PUC you know, a few months ago um, did not include much of any public outreach at all, right? And uh, I know there's a lot of frustration from some folks about that. It can be a challenge because the, those negotiations move very quickly, and there are also legal requirements on what we can talk about and what we can't talk about. So we try to do you know, outreach ahead of time so we get a sense of you know, what are community values and priorities and then try to carry those forward you know, through negotiation processes. But I, I'll be the first to admit, we did not do that as well as we should have. And um, I have talked to, to the staff about um, better going with the Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of minutes left and we have some 
questions that have come in on the, the Q&A. Um, so the first one that's come through is, um, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but it's, uh, what is your impression of the Boulder Excel plan to get to 100% renewable electricity by 2030? Are we on track? And this person says, I serve on the advisory panel, but I'm interested in learning your perspective. Well, thank you for your service. I appreciate the, the hard work you're doing there. And uh, so, yeah, so we have a gap to bridge in our 2030 100% renewable energy uh, goal for um, electricity and where Excel is pledging to be. So, you know, we're looking to the partnership to help us bridge that gap. So, uh, I mean, as I said before, we have not gotten as far yet with that as we had hoped, but I'd say I think it will gather momentum. I'll mention another thing that's not directly related to the partnership, but that I think is promising. In the last um, energy resource plan uh, discussions and settlements, uh, we're working on creating an option with Excel for uh, cities to actually purchase uh, power um, uh, power bids. I'm, I'm going to get the words a little bit wrong here, but you know, whenever Excel does a, a bidding process and, and they get a bunch of proposals for for creating new generation facilities, you know, they take a certain number of them and they, the rest of them they say, okay, we don't need those. That was as much as we needed. But some of those, like in the last um, sets of bids that they did, were still really good um, renewable energy projects. And so we, we're working with potentially developing a mechanism where okay, Excel puts everything out to bid, they take the top whatever 10 that they like, but a city such as Boulder could come in and say, you know what, that 11th one, that, that looks really good. We'd like to, to um, select that one. And then, so we could then uh, purchase or contract directly with that, um, uh, with the, the company that put that bid out and make that uh, other proposed generation proposal happen and then, you know, be creating 100% renewable energy that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been involved. And um, and I've asked um, our staff to do back of the envelope calculations and they said that the amount of funding that we roughly have available would, in fact, probably be enough to purchase enough energy through that process to get us to 100% renewables. Mm. So, right. so that's something really concrete um, that I'm excited about. It's going to take a few years probably for that to get fully implemented. Maybe it's two or three, so it's not a tomorrow kind of a thing, but I think it's a really exciting group to keep an eye on. Great. Uh, next question is, uh, she says, I appreciate this conversation in particular to the topic of gas lawn equipment. What I would like to raise is the airport that Boulder owns, which is a heavy producer of pollution with Hundreds of planes or slash operations flying daily with leaded fuel right over Northeast Boulder, in addition to the noise and carbon pollution. I'm curious that why climate discussion will cover leaf blowers, but the airport that flies circles uh, 10 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of air quality alert days. Um, is This is a huge pollution generation on anyone's radar. Your comments about that. Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's a challenge um, because the FAA very strictly limits a local community's ability to regulate their airport, the airport that's in the air. Like almost all the decision making authority is left up to the FAA. So you know, if if we were able to, I think we would absolutely regulate the number of hours that planes can fly, the noise levels, the flight paths, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the FAA just simply does not allow that. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, also, from a systems perspective, like the, the they use leaded gasoline, which is appalling to me that that's still in use in this day and age. Um, but again, we don't have any regulatory authority. So, so we're working in with the local operators, and we have a new airport manager, John Kinney, who's who's really trying to make things better out there. You know, on some of the the, the lifestyle impacts from things like noise, but also on moving forward, how can we encourage I think unloaded gasoline for planes is, is is still a little bit of a way off. But like, how to the extent that it comes online, how can we get it here quick? How can we encourage more electric airplanes and things like that? The the airplane, the airport is essentially you either have it or you don't have it. Your ability to regulate in between is very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're, we potentially looked at closing it. Um, it, it would be very expensive. Um, I I was uh, interested in looking at that possibility. <laughs> Not necessarily supporting, but looking at the possibility at the beginning of this year, but a majority of council didn't want to look too deeply into that. But on the other hand, it does serve, there's a transportation function that it serves, obviously, for some people, a limited, but some, but it has a, a bigger emergency services uh, uh, role as well that would be really tough to lose. So, you know, when there's a major fire or like in the 2013 floods, 
rescue missions were flown out of the airport. You know, if there's a big fire, you know, uh, we'll get um, we'll get air support from that airport, right? So there would be significant community impacts if the airport were to close. So it's it's not necessarily a slam dunk to do that, but it's it's deeply imperfect. I'll just say that as it stands. Okay, thank you. And then here's a question related to the CU South discussion. Uh, could you ask Aaron to address the greenhouse gases from the 750,000 square feet of office space and classroom that are going to be built in addition to the housing at CU South? Yeah, well, and to, to be clear, the that's allowed office space so that they, they, they might or they might not build that, that commercial space. So um, I think to the extent that that the university builds um, you know, classroom facilities, office facilities, I think the, the there are lower climate impacts when they build them all closer together, right? So that so that like central campus and east campus, you can run a bus back and forth all the time, and I, hardly anybody needs to drive between the two of them. I think you see a similar setup between CU South and the central campus or, or east campus that they're they'll be close together. They'll be um, They'll be tightly knit by transit, and uh, to the extent that they have um, classroom or office space down there, uh, we would certainly strongly encourage them to have it be for uh, oriented towards the use of people who live there as well uh, to minimize those transportation impacts. But I guess you know universities serve an important role in our society, right? So I think probably all of us support universities existing and being high, being high quality educational institutions to the extent that you're going to have them, to the extent that they mean to, need to expand to meet student demand, um, then I think what you want is to have them you know, centrally located with good, good transit connections and such like that. Thank you. So there are two more questions in the chat. We're at seven o'clock, but maybe if you're willing to take a, a, just another couple of minutes, we could sure. do those and then, and then wrap up and talk about coming attractions. So the next is, can you talk about the city's cool boulder campaign and how you prioritize this investment in natural climate solutions, including rebuilding soils to improve the ability of landscapes to hold water, absorb carbon and grow healthier food and habitats? Yeah, so this, this is part of our um, focus on not just emissions, but, but in resilience and then in natural, uh, natural solutions and systems, right? So it's not just about green electric cities and supply. Um, or reducing energy usage, but it's also about these natural solutions. So I'm personally a big fan of it. Uh, the city staff is working on that hard. So one of that is part of that is like preserving and improving our tree canopy, right? Because it you reduce heating effects when you have a healthy tree canopy. Uh, part of it is is uh, soil sequestration um, of carbon. So we have um, uh, pilot projects going on in our open space north of town on how you can improve soil health while also sequestering carbon. Uh, probably many of you know Elizabeth Black, who's been a pioneer in this area, and, and we're benefiting from her research work there. Um, and, uh, and, and all the way down to, uh, I was just at an event thanking people who were doing pollinator work. So there's folks who are uh, learning how to teach their neighbors how to implement pollinator-friendly gardens, mm -hmm. right? So that's, which, you know, is the direct link to emissions there? Maybe not, but when our natural systems are healthier, when our ecosystems are healthier, I think you do get some some natural sequestration of carbon, and I think you use end up using less energy overall with a, with a healthier environment like that. So we're, we're working on that from a number of different directions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, next question: Can Boulder protect trees? Currently, trees on private and public land are being cut down. Mature trees capture and store much more carbon than planting small new trees. Often the city is cutting down mature trees along the creeks and in the open space on, in mountain parks. Yeah, and it's always saddening when you see a, a mature tree cut down. Uh, it breaks my heart uh, to see it happen. The city for, forestry department does though kind of have to take a, a long-term view of these sorts of things. So like what was it, there's the cottonwood down it's about eighth or seventh and, and pearl um, that was mostly cut down a little while back. and. You know, folks were upset about that for understandable reasons, but it, it was becoming a safety hazard. You know, an old cottonwood will start to, to break in the wind. So when you have a street tree like that, you know, sometimes you have to you have to prune it back or, or cut it down. And then, of course, right now we're dealing with a horrendous uh, emerald ash borer uh, epidemic here where um, we will lose almost all of our ashes very, very sadly here in town over the next 
10 or 20 years. And so we're uh, sometimes we have to cut those down the infested ones um, just to slow the, the process a little bit. Um, and then we do treat, you know, a few really high profile ones um, to, to try to prevent them from being infested at all. So the, I mean, the city never wantonly cuts down a healthy tree, like that just doesn't happen. But but sometimes this is the forestry department kind of from a long-term view does have to cut down a tree that when you look at it from, from the outside may seem like, well, why wouldn't you just leave that there? But, but there are always reasons that they have. Thank you. So we're, we're just a little past the end of the hour. Thank you very much, um, Aaron, for uh, your time and your expertise and again for your service to all of us as, as mayor and on the city council. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary now to talk about uh, coming attractions. Great. Well, shall I say just a thank you right now? Yeah, thank you. Please. So uh, anyway, just uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to join you all uh, tonight. I know what a fantastic group this is, how knowledgeable you are, how hard you work for, for improving our world and fighting climate change. So Appreciate all your work and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Mary? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Brockett and Chris Hoffman for a very interesting conversation. Um, and my apologies, Aaron, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, inflate your uh, choral career. <laughs> sorry about that. No worries, Mary. <laughs> Uh, so again, thank you all for coming tonight and watching this. If you heard something interesting or learned something new, I would encourage you to please check out our website, empowerourfuture.org. Uh, we have obviously Empower Hours on an almost monthly basis. And it, again, the great thing is you can go and see the recordings of previous uh, events. So if your friends were not here, uh, tonight, weren't able to make it, send them to the website in a couple of days and that link will be available. Um, and again, my job now is to tell you that we have two more Empower Hours for this year coming up. Uh, Tuesday, November 15th at 6 p.m., uh, the wonderful, amazing Leslie Glustrom will be presenting on Community Choice Energy, basically CCE 101, everything you need to know about it and why we're looking forward to it and hopeful that uh, what the study uh, results are uh, propel us in that direction. Um, and then in December, Ken Ruggleson will be de demystifying the difference between air source and ground source heat pumps. So again, our Empower Hours are now on Tuesday evenings. They're almost always at 6 p.m. and last about an hour. Um, so thank you so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.